Good morning, everyone. Uh, today, uh, we have the first session, and we will start with the first talk by Talit Unger from Old Dominion University and Jefferson Lab. And he's going to tell us uh, on EIC jet physics and machine learning. Please welcome, Talit. OK. Um, <laughs> all right, well, thanks a lot. Um, and thanks a lot for the opportunity to be here <clears throat> and talk about this. Um, I changed the title a little bit from EIC Jet Physics to also include machine learning because I wanted to talk about some um, recent work where we've been thinking about applications of machine learning to phenomenology at colliders in the jet physics content uh, context, but also more, more broadly. Um, all right, so let me get started with jets. Um, we've, of course, already heard about this uh, at the workshop, um, but you know, jets are these collimated sprays of particles uh, that we see in the detector. You see here an illustration. Um, from CMS, where you see, um, in particular, these four jets that come out from the hard scattering vertex, um, where these cones are drawn around them. And to first approximation, we can think of those um, basically originating from a high-energy quark or gluon. Um, and sort of, in many ways, that's sort of the most direct access um, that we can um, have to these high-energy quarks and gluons. And one can make this also more, more quantitative, of course. Um, <clears throat> so we want to think about it in this way, that we have a hard quark or gluon that is produced here in the hard scattering vertex, then um, they, they shower and eventually hadronize, and um, they produce these you know, energetic sprays of particles uh, in the detector. Now, this was an example from uh, the LHC. Of course, also at the EIC, we will, we will have jet physics. Um, <clears throat> they will look a little bit different, um, but generally there will be jets produced at the EIC, and they're really a versatile tool um, in various aspects of the EIC um, science program. Um, and actually, because we have this sort of asymmetric collision rate of electrons and protons, there's actually more options to make use of jets. So we have different jet algorithms, um, different frames that we can make use of, and that really allows us you know, various handles on, on jets that we don't have actually in PD. Um, another advantage is that we'll have a very clean environment um, at the EIC, so things like um, pileup um, and, and multi-parton interactions are not going to be as much of a problem. Uh, of course, um, then at the Large Hadron Collider, so we can do very precise measurements. Um, and then there's a whole range of observables that we could look at in the context, um, for example, of jet substructure, where we look at the internal structure of jets, um, and you know, we try to you know, learn different things from that, like TMDs, um, like GPDs is related to that, um, and also, of course, studies like hadronization, nuclear modification, um, and so on. So that's um, the, the two main things, sort of jet substructure and then jet correlations, um, where you basically look at sort of the, the global topology of where the jets are at the event. And depending on you know, what observables you, con you construct and, and look at, you get, you're sensitive to TMDs and you know, various non-perturbative um, aspects that, that you might be interested in. Um, so let's first take a look at what jets are gonna look like. Um, so we have here in the upper right corner is the cross-section um, for inclusive jet production. Um, that's specifically in the lab frame um, in, as a function of the transverse momentum. And you can see it's a steeply falling cross-section, but it goes sort of up to 30, maybe 40 GeV where it can find jets. So it's, of course, relatively low energies um, compared to the LHC, but it's still a significant amount. Um, and here on the left, you see the number of particles that we expect in those jets, again, plotted as a function of the transverse momentum. Um, and you can see sort of in the highest PT region, um, you know, we go up to something like 10 or maybe 12 particles on average um, per jet. Um, if we go to lower transverse momentum, say 10 or so, then of course we have much less particles in the jet. Um, and I'll get back to that. That can sort of be a problem. But if you don't have that many particles in the jet, there's generally not as much information that you can get out of these jets, for example, in the context of jet substructure. So the more particles we have, the more information we have. And if you want to think about machine learning, then you know, the more information, the better. Um, so you know, the higher you know, we can go in PT, the, the better it's going to be. <clears throat> and so in general, um, there's two ways um, we can construct jets. Um, there's, we always need a hard scale for that. And in these asymmetric EP collisions, we can either have a hard scale that's directly set by the transverse momentum of the jet relative to the bright frame axis or the, the um, lab frame uh, uh, beam axis, or we can also just have um, a high virtuality Q squared. So both of those can be large or just one of them is sufficient. Um, and so in many cases, for example, we don't have to require a large transverse momentum, but we can just require 
large energy and then you know a high Q squared is, is sufficient um, to, to look at various jet cross sections. And to give you one example um, of where this can be relevant, for example, for TMDs and spin physics, um, what you can see here is an illustration um, of an event um, that we might see at the EIC. Um, so there's this gathered lepton here in red, and there's a jet recoiling um, in the opposite direction. And so if you want to construct an observable that's sensitive to TMDs, what you can measure is um, the vector sum of the transverse momenta of the electron, the scattered electron, or say a neutrino, for example, um, and the recoiling um, jet on the other side. So that's the, the imbalance QT. Um, at leading order, that would just be zero. And um, you know, if you go to higher orders, but if it's still small um, relative to the hard scale um, of the process, then that gives you access um, to TMDs. Um, so that's illustrated here, right? So we have the incoming electron and proton. If you polarize the incoming proton uh, transversely to the, um, the beam direction, then by measuring this transverse momentum QT, um, in, if that's a small quantity, then we'll be you know, sensitive to TMD physics. And you, know, you can write down um, TMD factorization theorems that look like this, and you're gonna be sensitive. In the spin polarized case, you're gonna be sensitive to, for example, the Sivers function. Um, and actually, one of the interesting things here is that you're only gonna be sensitive to TMD PDFs, so there's no sensitivity to TMD fragmentation functions, so you, know, you can study these type of things in isolation, it sort of gives you a way to disentangle um, TMD PDFs and fragmentation functions, so the initial and final state, you can just separate them out. Um, and here's an example of a calculation that we did. Um, this is specifically for the Sivers function um, you know, at the EIC, and you can see here the relatively large um, theory uncertainty that we currently have, or at least that we had when we wrote the paper. Um, and this is plotted here as a function of this transverse momentum QT, so the absolute value of the transverse momentum. Um, and you can also see here uh, the size of um, you know, the data that we're gonna expect or that we expect to see at the EIC, at least that's the statistical uncertainty. Um, at least the statistical uncertainty is significantly um, smaller than the uncertainty we currently have um, on, on the Sivers function. Um, and so this is, this is in the, um, the laboratory frame, but well, we can do very similar things also in the bright frame. That's some of the things we're currently working on. Um, and then you, you basically also have a handle, for example, on you know, gluon PDFs, gluon serous function, and things, things like that. Um, so what I wanna talk about, um, or sort of a motivation for the rest of the talk, is um, basically these, these spin asymmetries, right? So um, basically what is shown here, right? Um, here we just put it you know, at zero sort of for illustration purposes. Um, but what you often find in spin asymmetries, whether at the IC or, or RIC or you know, any, any of these, these measurements, is that they often turn out to be really, really small and they turn out to be difficult to measure because of that. Um, and so you can see here an example. Um, this is from the STAR uh, collaboration. Um, what they measured is very similar to um, you know, this case here where you look at this back-to-back -back production of a lepton and a jet. Um, if you're in PP collisions, then you basically want to measure two jets that are recoiling against each other. Um, and again, you basically transversely polarize one of the initial um, protons, so it's a single transverse spin asymmetry. Um, and as it turns out, when they do this measurement, then the spin asymmetry is, is basically zero. Um, and that's, that's what's shown in this, this plot here. And so one way around this issue that these spin asymmetries are often small, you know, the idea they had in, in uh, in this work is to apply an additional measurement um, or basically, basically an additional substructure measurement to these jets. Um, and in this case, they applied specifically the jet charge. Um, <clears throat> and what the jet charge does is basically separate out up and down quark um, contributions. So you do this additional measurement, you place an additional cut on the jet charge measurement and suddenly you get a finite asymmetry. Um, and so that's what you see here. So this is basically one side if you have, say, a large value of the jet charge, you get a you know, finite is positive asymmetry, and if you apply you know, the cut on the other side, you get a um, finite um, negative asymmetry. And what is shown here, just on the right side, that's sort of averaged sort of over the entire range of you know, what's plotted down here. Um, if you average again, you get the green point, and it's exactly at zero. And that basically tells you, you know, sort of the naive application right, of, of um, jets to, to spin asymmetries often gives you very small uh, quantities, um, and so the question is, you know, how can we make that larger? Um, we can also understand that from the theory side, right, there are things like the Burkhardt sum rule, right, that basically tell you if you integrate it, um, then, you know, you sort of expect 
um, basically opposite sign of up and down core contributions and that, you know, if you don't apply an additional measurement, then that can very quickly average out to zero. And so one of the questions we had because of this, this problem in general is, can we potentially use machine learning um, to, um, you know, significantly increase the size of these asymmetries? And what that, you know, in the long run would allow us to do is reduce significantly the uncertainties on, say, you know, the, you know, whatever non-perturbative quantity we want to extract, say, the Sirius function or, you know, any kind of PDF or fragmentation function and so on. Um, <clears throat> that's sort of the, 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 main, the main goal and the way to do it, you know, we think is instead of using a jet charge, maybe we can use machine learning to actually do that. Uh, and, you know, basically formulate it as a classification task um, for, for jets. <clears throat> and so, um, for machine learning, or specifically classification of jets, there's been quite a bit of work um, in the LHC context. Um, there you're primarily interested, say, in enhancing your signal for BSM physics, so you want to make it more quark-like, for example, so you want to distinguish, you know, all these quark jets that originated from quarks uh, relative to um, the gluon, and people have developed, you know, all kinds of sophisticated machine learning um, architectures to basically not use observables, right, so kind of low-dimensional projections of the total information content that is available, but just use the full event-by-event -event information. So, for example, images here, and you train a classifier, and it will tell you whether it's a quark or a gluon jet. And what has been found, and that was sort of the motivation for us, is that um, pretty much in all these studies, machine learning significantly outperforms any sort of observable that theorists have come up with in the past. And so that was sort of our motivation for this, right? Maybe also in the case of spin physics, right? We can find much better uh, ways to, you know, separate up and down quark jets, for example, and generate large spin asymmetries. Um, that's sort of the, the idea. Um, we always gonna quantify here these classifiers, um, you know, whether it's based on images like this or, you know, the ones that I'll talk about in terms of so-called rock curves. Um, that's shown here on the right. So just quickly to review it, if you had a, of a more simple observable, you know, something that we can easily calculate, uh, and perturb QCD might be something like the jet mass. Right? So if you have gluons, they generally have a larger jet mass, so they peak at larger values, quarks peak at lower values. Um, and then you can basically put a decision cut here, or a decision threshold, and count everything that's, say, on the left as your signal. Um, then, you know, you keep a lot of the uh, quark jets, but you also make an error. Um, like, you know, you keep a certain amount of the, the gluon background. And then each position of the decision threshold um, co you know, is converted to one single point here on this, this rock curve. Um, and as you move the decision threshold left and right, you sort of map out this, this line here. And what you want to see in these plots is basically to be as close as possible to the upper right corner. Um, so if you're all the way up here, then you're keeping 100% of the signal and you're rejecting all the background. If you have a random classifier, you'd be here basically somewhere on the diagonal. So you're just basically randomly guessing. And so what you can see is that traditional observables like the jet mass, um, you know, the one over here, uh, that's shown this dashed blue line, and machine learning, you know, is all the way over here. And, you know, this was from, this is an example from 2019. Now people have found even better ways of doing it, and you're even closer to the upper right corner. So that basically tells us, right, if you use machine learning, we can do way better um, that we, and, you know, we would with sort of these traditional observables that are inspired um, by, by sort of theoretical considerations in, in, in QCD. Okay, so what we wanted to do is to see if we can also do that at DIC. And so we generated um, two data sets. Um, one is basically using this leading order scattering process here, where we have just incoming electron scattering off the proton. We have a lepton in the final state um, and a jet. So there's no gluon contributions here, but we can use it to, for example, distinguish up, down, and strange jets. Um, so that's one data set to basically do a flavor um, separation. And um, because we don't have gluons here, we also generated events uh, using the photo production region. So in this case, we produce a dijet pair, and now you know, we have a quark and a gluon um, contribution. So I basically want to show two examples. Um, one is um, you know, a quark-gluon classification, and the other one is um, isolating specifically strange jets compared to up and down quarks. And um, the machine learning architecture we're using here is not images, um, but what turns out to work uh, very well is to just say that all the particles in the jet are just some you know, unordered set of particles. Um, and so what we're using here are deep sets that are, you know, um, are permutation invariant, that are specifically built for, for set-like um, um, a data set, right, where there's no ordering, or in the context of particle physics, it's known as particle flow networks. And so what it is, 
is basically shown in this equation. So it takes as input uh, the particle four vectors of all the particles that you have in the jet. So say the transverse momentum, the rapidity, um, and the azimuth angle, and the PID of each particle. Um, then, as illustrated here, you apply a first neural network um, based on this input, and you map it to some very large um, latent space. Um, and then you do a summation operation in the latent space, and that basically makes sure that the entire result is permutation invariant, right? So if you interchange particles one and two, it doesn't, doesn't matter for the final output. And then you have a second neural network, um, F, that basically takes all of that and shrinks it down from the large latent space and just gives you like a final number um, that is then used to, to, to do the classification, right? So the binary, binary classification task. Um, so it's basically just this sort of, you know, sequence of two types of neural networks and, you know, that turns out is something we can train quite efficiently. Um, there are similar things, um, you know, that, that one can use here um, as well that people have looked at um, at the LHC, like graph neural networks, transformers, and so on. They'll perform a little bit better um, uh, overall, but here we're more interested sort of in theory considerations, so, you know, any of these uh, really do, do the job uh, in this book. Okay, so here's the first example. Um, we looked at this um, for quark versus gluon jets, so specifically uh, using this, this photo production data set. And what you can see here is basically the analog of, you know, the, the plot I showed you before for the LHC. So we have a traditional observable, the jet mass is this dotted uh, light blue line. And then, yeah, so everything is sort of reversed here. So we want to be as close as possible now to the upper left corner as opposed to the upper right corner. And if you use machine running, then, you know, we gain something here, right? It's definitely better than, than the jet mass. Um, but it's also not all that much. And so one of the reasons here is that we've been using jets that are really way below, or that, that, are, that are below 10 GeV. So I forget the exact number, but something like seven GeV or so. And that region, you really just have very few particles, right? And that's basically what you see here, right? Different than at the LHC, there's not all that much information available. And that means also the machine cannot, you know, make use of it, you know, this, this, I mean, it certainly makes use of the information, but that's just not all that much there, right? If you imagine there was just a single particle, right? Then it couldn't do anything, right? It, it would. <clears throat> it really has to look at sort of correlations between different particles. Um, and so, you know, if we go to too low um, transverse momentum, then the machine learning can also not do all that much. Um, what we realized, though, is the, the task is really quite different than, um, than at the LHC, right? At the LHC, you really want to have a look at a single jet, identify that, and then look at the next one. Here, we're really more interested in tagging or identifying the hard scattering process, right? Um, that's basically what we would want to do. So we don't have to limit ourselves necessarily um, to just a single jet, but we can also use the recalling jet, or we could use just all the particles in the event. And that's what you see here. So this is the line, if you just use the leading jet to do the classification, if you include the second leading jet or the recalling jet, and if you include all particles in the event, then you get this actually really good result. So this red line is actually very close you know, to the classification um, that you would see um, at the LHC. And so that is, of course, very encouraging. Right now we see a significant gain in machine learning. Alternatively, right, we would have to limit ourselves to higher PT jets, but then there's really a lot of information, right, that we can make use of. And of course, then that also requires further theory efforts, how we can, you know, make use of that in a way that's meaningful and interpretable uh, in, in QCD. But generally, we do find, you know, a significant gain uh, in machine learning for quark uh, versus gluon uh, classification. Now, the second example I wanted to show is strange jet tagging. So here we're looking, trying to classify up and down quark jets versus strange jets. And, you know, the best machine learning result that we could get with the architecture that we used <clears throat> is shown here in, in this, this I don't know, purple line. Um, and as you can see, this is really close now to the upper left corner. And it significantly outperforms sort of anything else, you know, that you would normally, you know, think of if you do strange jet tagging. So in particular, right, there's sort of a more, um, you know, maybe physics-inspired idea would be to require that the leading particle um, in the jet is a strange hadron. Um, in that case, we can't make a rock curve, right, because that there's no decision threshold we vary. That's just a single point in this rock curve. Um, and that's shown over here, right? So there's a single point here. If we just require the leading particle to be a strange hadron, then we're somewhere down here. And as you can see, you know, there's a significant difference here if we use all the information uh, that is provided by the events um, will achieve much better um, um, classification. And, and that's, you know, certainly something we could try to make use of, right? If this is now the leading order um, DIS process, right? If we're able to reliably identify um, 
you know, a sample of jets that, that originates from strange quarks, then we can get really much better constraints, say, on the strange PDF. Because um, that, of course, directly correlates right, with, say, the strange PDF that you would like to extract um, um, from the data. Okay, so we see also here um, there's significant uh, improvement uh, using machine learning. Now, the question is basically how can we make use of that information, right? So what we did now is we do a classification task, we get a rock curve, but we want to get all the way over here where we sort of reduce the uncertainty on, say, a PDF, like the strange PDF. Um, and so the way, you know, we can think about this is that what we would want to do is try to approximate, or what we have now is sort of an optimal classifier over here. Um, if you want to, <coughs> if you wanted to include this, uh, eventually, say, in some global analysis of PDFs, right, then we have to use well-defined observables in QCD that we can calculate perturbatively or include some non-perturbative components and then extract, say, the PDF in a global analysis. So what we would need to do is find some observables that approximate as well or, or as good as possible this optimal classifier for machine learning. Um, if we find this observable, like a single observable, or say a sub, or, or sort of a small set of observables, then we can do theory calculations, we can do you know, measurements that we can fully correct for, um, and then you know, we can include that data in a global analysis. So we still have to basically do Sort of these steps to sort of make it rigorous in, in QCD. Um, and that's again something that you don't necessarily think about um, at the LHC if you just care about enhancing you know, your signal to, to BSM physics that you say expect to be more quark like. Um, then you don't necessarily have to do all these steps. But here in QCD, right, if we're interested in some non perturbative physics, we have to make sure it's somehow well defined. Um, and so one of the things that we need is basically a way to find observables that work very well. And so one way to think about this is to think in terms of complete sets um, um, of observables, and I say more um, what I mean by that. Um, one of the things one has to be a little bit careful about here that we realized, and it's again something that's not really discussed in the machine learning literature because it's not really relevant for them, but what we need are observables that are defined both at the event by event level and at the ensemble level, so if we aggregate over all the events. So what I mean by that is, for example, if we have the jet mass, right, then that gives us a single number for a jet per event, then we histogram you know, all the event samples and we get, say, um, a result like you know, shown here in this panel. Um, and then that's something we can compare to QCD, right, by doing perturbative calculation, including some non perturbative effects and whatnot. But it's defined, there's one histogram that we get by aggregating over all the events and we have a single number per event, right? So that's basically what we wanna have. But of course we said, well, the jet mass is not that great, but it needs to be something like this. So what we can't really make use of um, are things that are only defined at the event level or that are only defined at the ensemble level. So for example, what we typically use um, as input to the machine running is really the position information, so rapidity and phi. Right? So that's definitely defined at the event level, but it's not really defined, right? so it's really just you know, these, these points or individual particles right? that we sort of give the coordinates and rapidity and phi. But that's not really something that's defined after aggregating all the events, right? We would just get some distribution in phi and eta, and that's not really something we can make use of, right? And it would give us like a single histogram at the end, versus here we sort of have individual numbers, multiple numbers uh, per event. What we also can't use are things um, that are sort of only defined at the ensemble level, um, and that's things, for example, like inclusive jets or inclusive uh, correlators, such as energy energy correlators and so on, they cannot be used for tagging, so because they're not really defined at the event level. So <clears throat> in particular, if you think about inclusive jets, right, what you do is you take all the jets that you have in the event, and then you put them in histograms over here. And only after you aggregate over many uh, events, then what you're getting is the inclusive jet cross-section, right? But there's no inclusive jet cross-section event by event. And the same thing basically holds for correlators. So while these observables are very nice from the QCD perspective, Right, the reason that we look at inclusive hadrons, inclusive jets, is because they're simple in QCD, right? Because we can calculate it because it's inclusive, um, but it's really just defined at the ensemble level, so it's not suitable for machine learning. Um, what you could do, of course, is to look at, say, the leading jet spectrum, subleading jet spectrum, and so on and so forth. Right, that's defined at the event level and it's defined at the ensemble level. <clears throat> right, say so for example, for the leading jet, we get a number at, at a given event and then we get a single histogram for the leading jet, and the same for the subleading and so on, right, versus inclusive, we just get a single histogram and that's it. So there's no really, it's not really a mapping between the information content event by event and at the ensemble level. So we have to limit ourselves to things that are defined at, at both. 
Um, so luckily, there's at least two things um, that are known in the literature with you know, the way this can be done. Uh, one of them is the endogenous spaces, and the other one are energy flow polynomials. Um, but if you want to apply this to the EIC, we definitely need more uh, development uh, in, in this direction. Um, so these are complete sets of observables. They're in principle infinite set of observables. Um, if we measure all of them, then we have all the information we can possibly get out um, you know, from the EIC or any collider experiment. Um, they're infrared collinear safe. That's also a, you know, a nice thing to have. Um, and they're, you know, what I mean is in particular, they're defined both at the event and the ensemble level. And so we can use it again sort of in the second step, right? Once we do have a classifier, we want to identify observables, you know, from this complete set, for example, right, that are the most relevant ones, right? And then we have those as an additional measurement similar to the jet charge, and that can, you know, really, say, give us much larger spin asymmetries, for example. Or at least that's, that's the hope. Um, so let me give you an example of what this looks like. Um, so this is the so-called Angelina spaces uh, from Andrew Larkowski developed this. So the idea here is that you systematically map the um, phase-based variables that you have. So if you have you know, M particles or M emissions in the final state, then you subtract momentum conservations on total. You have three, four, uh, three times M minus four uh, uh, variables, and you map those two observables. So for example, if you have two particles, right, then you have, have um, you know, six minus four variables, so just two. That can be, for example, momentum fraction Z and the relative opening angle theta. That's the only two variables you have uh, or you know, the two particle case. Uh, or the, the two emission case. And so what they basically did is to relate these two variables that, specifies to, that specify the full information content in this case to certain ratios of n jettiness um, variables, which are defined in this way. The details are not too important here. Um, so that we would have to introduce two variables in this case. Um, then, of course, we have to continue going to a three particle case, four particle, and so on and so forth. And you basically just add more and more of these n jettiness variables. Um, so in principle, it's an infinite set, right? If you have infinitely many particles, but in practice, of course, you can truncate it somewhere depending on the particle multiplicity. And so if you just measure enough of these angetiness variables, right, that in principle contains all the information content. And so then the hope would be basically that the machine learning can tell us, you know, which one of those is actually the most relevant or which maybe say a set of those or a subset of those or a combination of them is, is what sort of gives as a really good classifier that really captures the, the essence of the, of the information that we need. So we can put this to a neural network, basically do some kind of feature selection, and that will allow us to identify the most relevant observables. These observables, of course, well-defined in perturbative QCD, and we can use the, these as an additional tagger or classifier uh, for the jet, and then we can you know, um, do our global analysis on these things. And so this, in principle, is something that can be done. We've done this um, in the context of heavy ion physics. Um, and you know, it's, it's generally possible to, to do this. So if one side notice, maybe like these are actually Sudikov safe variables here um, versus the input here is IRC safe. More some, some details, but in both cases are sort of calculable um, and you know, one can make that you know, sufficiently rigorous uh, in, in QCD. So in principle, there's, there's a way to do this. Um, what has been found though is that using the set of observables doesn't quite match the performance of these best classifiers. Um, so this is a table here that shows various classifiers, um, and now here the performance is, is you know, measured here in terms of the area under the curve, um, the area under the rock curve specifically. So you see here three examples, right? If you have the random classifier, then the area under the curve is 0.5. If it's perfect, the area under the curve is one, and otherwise it's somewhere in between. And so what you can see here in this table is an IRC unsafe classifier, um, you know, has sort of the best performance um, up here. If you use this complete set of observables, like the n jettiness basis, we're somewhere down here. Um, and sort of in absolute values, the gap is actually not that large, but, you know, for different classification problems, it can be much larger. And also, you know, by now, this number has actually increased quite a bit. So there somehow seems to be sort of a, a, a gap in performance between you know, using these observables that are well-defined in QCD and using you know, sort of the best possible classifier. So that basically means if you want to approximate the best classifier with things that are well-defined in QCD, there's sort of a gap in between. Um, and so at the moment, it's a little bit unclear where that gap is really coming from, but I think we really need to understand that gap because that essentially dict or, or tells us um, 
how we should try to extract all the information that appears to be there in these events. And there's a couple of possibilities where that gap could come from. One is that, well, this is IRC unsafe, right, versus these NGDNS observables are Sudokov safe or IRC safe. Um, so that could be the reason. Or it has to do with a type of input, right? So here we're usually using this position information, right, versus here is more sort of relative angles, right? That, that could be the reason. Or the architecture is really just different, right? That is used here. That's a normal neural network. Here you have this sort of permutation variant neural network and things like that, right? So it could be any of these things. Um, and it's not really, I don't have an answer to all the, you know, these three questions, right? We haven't fully nailed down where that difference is coming from. But I would say it's really essential to try to do this to really max out the information content, um, you know, that, that we get from, from collider experiments. Now, one of the questions I think we sort of answered, which is the first one. And so um, the question is basically, you know, is IRC safe information um, all you need for jet classification, right? Or do you need to be IRC unsafe? Um, and then, of course, you'd be sensitive much more to sort of non-perturbative effects, right, and emissions that are, you know, at very narrow angles that are almost more difficult to measure experimentally, potentially, right? Um, and so that sort of is one of, you know, the, the first questions we would, we would want to answer. And so the way we try to answer it is to basically use the same machine learning architecture, but have the input be either IRC safe or unsafe. And so the way we did that is to basically take all the JET constituents that we have and recluster them into subjets with a radius R that's smaller than the initial radius of the JET. So here you can see it's a very large, small R radius. Then as we go to the left, we decrease the radius, right? So we basically cluster these jets, or these particles into more subjets and even more subjets. And if we take the limit of small R going all the way to zero, then we basically re recover a fully IRC unsafe classifier where basically again, you know, feed to the machine learning uh, architecture just the information of particles, okay? So with, you know, by, by Looking at this value of R, we can basically tune the sensitivity to infrared collinear safe emissions, uh, sorry, to infrared and collinear emissions, right, that are otherwise sort of masked in, you know, these kind of subjects. As we take the limit to zero, we recover something that's completely IRC unsafe, but that is the maximum performance. Um, and so the machine learning architecture is now the same. We train on position information here of the subjects or the particles, and we want to compare the performance. Okay. Um, and so the idea is basically to see if the maximum performance is only obtained when the subject radius goes to zero, or do we already get a maximum performance for a finite radius, okay? So that's, that's what we wanted to see. So um, this is, again, the area under the curve. Um, if our radius is equal to the original jet radius, right, then all particles in the subject are just grouped together, right? We have no a way to do any classification. So our area under the curve is 0.5. So that's where we're starting from. And then in this direction, we lower the jet radius on a log scale. And as expected, sort of the curve goes up, right? The classification performance goes up. Um, and what we find is that actually for a finite value here of the subject radius, we already match the maximum performance that we would get in the infrared collinear unsafe case. Okay, so that means for a finite value, um, we already achieved maximum performance. Um, and so, you know, from that, it appears that IRC unsafe or unsafe, for linear safety or unsafe is, is not um, the problem, right? For a finite radius, we already achieve uh, maximum performance. Um, we also looked, sorry, this was an example for quark versus gluon jet tagging. Um, this is an example of QCD versus Z jet tagging. In this case, even for a much larger value of the subject radius of 0.1, we already achieved the maximum performance. Um, <clears throat> and we can actually even identify the scale where this plateau is reached. And it's at, it depends on the PT of the jet. Um, but whenever the PT of the jet times the subject radius of order 5 GV, then we reach um, you know, this, this plateau and we reach the maximum performance. And that's really, you know, for, for, for you know, the purpose that we care about, that's basically a perturbative scale. And we can think of this classification problem, um, you know, essentially as an IRC safe uh, a problem. Um, so tentatively, the answer is yes, all we need, um, you know, is really just infrared collinear safe information, which is great news. There's also a theoretical perspective on this, um, why people sort of expect this to be an infrared collinear safe problem. Um, and that basically means that, you know, we should be able to map all the information 
in an infrared cloning and safe way to observables that we can control well um, in, in QCD. Yep, I'm almost done, thanks. Um, and so in this sense, it's a, you know, the, this type of classifier is really gapless compared to you know, the n sub jettiness uh, observables um, that I mentioned before um, in, in this complete set of observables. So we addressed one of these qu questions here, right? It does not appear that infrared colonia safety is the problem, right? It appears um, that we should be able to map all the information um, that we see in these machine learning studies to information that's well controlled uh, in QCD. And so now we basically have to think about um, if sort of this gap is coming from one of these other things. Um, that's something we're currently working on. It appears that, we, or we think we can relate it to the sort of problems in graph theory and that there's some underlying NP hardness that the machine learning is trying to tackle and that may lead to the gap, um, but that's still ongoing work and I don't have an answer um, as of now. But trying to answer this, I think really will provide guidance for how we can really make use of this full information content and eventually shrink here, um, you know, the uncertainty on say the, the strange um, I'll skip this. I think there's ways to potentially train these things specifically for spin physics um, on the data. That's sort of a question more for the experimental side, but I think ways of sort of maximizing these asymmetries can be cast as a classification uh, problem. Um, and so just coming to summary here, um, in general, you know, there's a lot of opportunities in JETS, a lot of open questions, um, sort of on the more formal theory side, but also, you know, trying to make use of all this information content I don't want to run the experiment and then say we have left all this information on the table. We should try to think about how to make use of that information. Um, <clears throat> and eventually, of course, our figure of merit should be, you know, a reduction here um, in the uncertainty, right, of, of you know, whatever non-perturbative quantity we're, we're interested in. At the moment, of course, we're not quite there yet to do these kind of studies. <clears throat> if we wanted to, um, we could in principle use these kind of rock curves, right, that we currently have as the figure of merit, right, um, because they directly depend on what choices you make for the detector, right? If you can do PID only to this level or you can reconstruct the transverse mental of particles only to a certain threshold, that immediately affects the total information you could possibly get out, right? So that directly affects this here. So potentially uh, it can even already at this point, you know, when we just have these rock curves, have some in influence on, on, you know, potential designs of, of detectors and so on. Um, all right, with that, thank you so much. To Felix for this wonderful talk. Any questions? <laughs> Thanks. Uh, uh, thank you very much. Very nice talk. And uh, I have a, a naive question. I hope it's not so stu uh, stupid enough. What is the impact of I, uh, the accuracy of your theoretical calculations of these jets on your finding? I mean, when you, when you compute your rock or your, your uh, uh, yeah the, the the efficiency basically you need to calculate uh, the, the the jets and if you if you do it in next to leading order and next to next to leading order does it make any any difference on these results right so 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 these type of things are basically done these are basically pythia studies right you would want to do it on the event right so like that's not something we can calculate right that's why we basically need this additional step right to translate that information to well-defined observables in QCD, right? And that's sort of, I mean, that's that's doable, right? If you sort of add additional n sub jettiness observables, right? That's something you, you could do and you could calculate, say, a next to leading log, and then, you know, convert that into a global analysis. But these things here, that's exactly the problem, right? We, we can't calculate the rock curves directly, at least not in this form. I think there's ways to calculate rock curves directly, but not, not in the way it's currently done. Uh, so thanks for this great talk. I was wondering uh, the place where you were talking about the IRC safe uh, co like constituents is whether all you need for the jet tagging, right? I mean, in right. the M ML context. Uh, did you pass your train network through one of the available AI explainers and try to see if the output scores are correlated with the IRC safe observables of QCD? Just to understand the neural network is learning the similar kind of stuff what you're, you want them to learn as physics. So is this kind of studies are done? Um, we, we have not looked at that. that. That may be something useful to look into. It depends on how well you can sort of enforce first principle ideas of QCD in those type of things. Right, right. And so I mean, we, we've been trying to do it you know, that way, but there may definitely be other ways of, of doing it. Mm -hmm. um, so it's definitely something to, good to think about. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Alessandro. 
So apart from uh, uh, jet physics, where can you use these uh, methods also for uh, hadrons uh, observables? Like I might think about the problem of uh, separating uh, current from uh, target fragmentation regions. Is there something, did you think about something else which is not jet related? So, and maybe can be already used in present experiments and not at the EAC? Right, I mean, so I would say it's, it's, it's not at all jet related, right? It's just that, you know, that's sort of how we thought about it initially, right? But a lot of the things that I've showed here, right? This is specifically for jets, but this is like the full event, right? Um, so you can use all the information basically, right? And so, like, like I mean, if, if you were to do only SIDIS with hadrons, right? Then I would think you're sort of in this point over here, right? So you, one could think about how to do event-wide, you know, say event global observables, right, to try to, you know, get closer to this upper left corner. Um, for specifically target versus current, my, I, I'm not quite sure. My thinking is that it's more theory question than a way to do it with machine learning, but I, but I could be wrong. But it's definitely much more general, right? You could use this, I don't know, maybe there's ways to find the best observable for small x physics or whatever, right? Like there's, like a lot of things one could think about in this context, right? It's definitely not limited to jets or, or anything. It's just that, Sort of the, the literature sort of came from jets um, to you know think about these things from that perspective, but it's not limited. So we have three more questions, three short questions, and probably three short answers. But the first one. Yeah, nice talk, Felix. So can you go back to your slide, probably five or six, where you uh, showed the asymmetry react, the asymmetry result? I think yeah, this one. Mm -hmm. So uh, is there a reason why you uh, took this PT region, particularly for 15 to 20? Because this uncertainty, isn't it like uh, PT sensitive? Yes, it's definitely sensitive. Right, yeah, so yeah. It's, it's, what is the reason of taking particular region? Um, that's a good question. I, I'm not quite sure. We looked at different, this is like one, one plot, there's you know, other ones okay. one, can, one can make. I think it also, like, so in this case, I think it's like integrated over a relatively wide range or so, then you get right. relatively large uncertainties. Um, you know, if you limit it more, the uncertainty goes down. So it, there's no particular reason for this. This was just an Yeah, example. so, so my, uh, like, uh, I'm curious because the lower PT study could be like more, uh, like lower PT prediction could be uh, like more interesting. Maybe we it, can it may, take yeah. this. Yeah. Right. And, and uh, two quick questions, one from above. Yeah. So then again, probably a naive question related to what, what was asked earlier. The uncertainty estimates that you could make for giving, you know, representing some of the non-perturbative regimes that you showed then going into the perturbative regime, does that capture the uncertainty, do you think that, you know, are you able to somehow capture that, the fact that we don't know much about that and can calculate? Is this something that you're trying to do or? So you, you mean at the level of the, the classification? Or yes, the, yes. Um, I mean, you can only do it basically if you train it on like observables, right? So if you, if you train it on, on say these endgenous things, right? Then, then you can make a sort of a quantitative statement about uncertainties. If you just train it on, on the raw data on you know, locations of particles, there's nothing we can say about QCD. But yes, that's sort of the idea. But ideally, we would like to do this because we can make these you know, quantitative assessments, right? We would like to frame it that way, yeah. Thanks. Yes, yeah, so that goes exactly in the same direction. How do you determine your bias of what you have done? Because I take my data, I uh, use an AI ML, I have not a sample which tells me that is what I have to do because a Monte, uh, I can use maybe a Monte Carlo, but it might not have the physics in it. So what is it, what I'm really doing? Yeah, I, I would say it depends. Like if in some cases, I think there's a reasonable, so yes, I mean, these are Monte Carlo studies, right? So one has to be careful, right? I'm not 100% sure what exactly, you know, if, if we can trust this to that extent. I do think there is like, maybe the exact numbers are, not 100% sure, but I would say there is a lot more information there. I think that's something we can reliably take away from this. But then indeed the idea would have to be to go to an observable level. For training in principle, you could do it directly at the data. For spin physics, you can do it on the data. And for quark gluon, you can also do it on the data with weakly yeah, supervised. I, I still have a problem to determine my systematics of uh, what I train on because I don't know what the truth is. 
Right, right, right. No, I, I understand. But so I think it, it can be addressed. Um, I, I skipped it over. Um, it's probably a longer discussion. Um, but I think in, in some cases it can be addressed systematically. In some cases we need more development. Um, uh, I'm sorry to cut it off at this point. I mean, we are really, you can take it outside. And uh, we, we have to move on to the, the next talk. Thank you, Felix, for this wonderful talk that generated so many questions.